Number 16. Albert Lee Gardner 29-year-old Albert Lee Gardner was freed from a Florida state prison in 2023 after serving nine and a half years for lewd and lascivious battery. The heavily tattooed ex-con, nicknamed the Joker, faced five and a half years of probation, but he lasted just a day in the free world before he was back in police custody for violating the terms of his release. After noticing that Gardner's ankle monitoring bracelet had been in the same place at a 7-Eleven store in Brooksville, Florida, a probation officer asked deputies to scope out the scene. They found Gardner's ankle bracelet in the store's trash can. Thankfully, law enforcement didn't have to look very hard to find the fleeing felon. Shortly after discovering the detached ankle monitor, deputies responded to a call about an overdose at a local residence. They arrived to find Gardner unconscious from what his sister described as an unknown narcotic and revived him using Narcan. After being medically cleared, he was booked into custody without bond for violating probation and tampering with an electronic monitoring device. Number 15. Joseph Zeller 32-year-old Lisa Story and her friend's daughter, Robin Cornell, were brutally murdered at a condominium in Cape Coral, Florida in 1990. Story was watching over the home for Robin's mom, Jan Cornell, who spent the night with her boyfriend and returned to a horrific scene. Both victims were brutally assaulted and beaten and then strangled. Detectives struggled to identify the killer and leads dried up. The case went cold and it remained unsolved even after advancing technology enabled law enforcement to obtain the suspect's DNA profile. He wasn't a match to anyone in the criminal database, and it began to seem like the killer would never be brought to justice. Finally, in 2016, a man who was required to give a DNA sample in an unrelated felony battery case turned up as a match to the profile of Lisa Story and Robin Cornell's killer. Joseph Zeeler, who was 54 years old at the time, was charged with burglary, battery, and two counts of first-degree murder, and he faced the possibility of the death penalty if convicted. He claimed that his DNA was found at the crime scene because he had been intimate with Robin's mother, Jan Cornell, months before the double homicide. Prosecutors argued that if this were true, the DNA wouldn't have survived long enough to still be detectable when the evidence was tested. Zeeler called Jan Cornell a pig who never washed her sheets, and Jan made it clear that she didn't know Zeeler and had certainly never slept with him. The accused double murderer maintained his innocence throughout the case, filing at least 12 motions in various attempts to change the course of the case. In one handwritten letter filed in June of 2022, Zeeler made what he described as a fair offer to avoid a trial. He wanted the DNA evidence retested, and if any of the results incriminated him in the murders, he would waive a trial and go straight to sentencing. The defendant challenged the previous findings, arguing that he was innocent and that a blonde hair found at the scene couldn't possibly belong to him. Zila also sent at least three letters to Jan Cornell, threatening to seek revenge against her if she didn't try to interfere with the investigation into the case. But there was ultimately nothing he could do to stop the case from going to trial, and he was found guilty of both murders and sentenced to death. During his sentencing hearing, the convicted killer flashed an unusually white smile with the word killer written on what looked like a set of dentures. According to Zeeler's attorney, the false teeth were actually a veneer made from styrofoam, which he had crafted in jail. A short while later, Zeeler motioned for his attorney, Kevin Shirley, to come talk to him while he stood in the courtroom surrounded by bailiffs. When Shirley came over, Zeeler motioned for him to lower his head as if he had to discuss a private matter. But he tried to elbow Shirley in the face instead and was instantly taken down by the bailiffs. Shirley told the Mirror that he and Zeeler had a good working relationship up until that point. He had spoken with the cold-blooded killer in close proximity before and had never been attacked. It's unclear what Zeeler was trying to accomplish with his disturbingly decorated teeth or by throwing his elbow in the lawyer's face. According to Shirley, he had expected the death penalty, so it didn't make sense to think he was angry over his sentence. But the courtroom footage of the incident sent chills down the spines of many who agreed that Zeeler had no problem pulling off the look of a sociopathic and remorseless killer who truly does not feel bad about taking human lives. Number 14. Savannah Grace White 
One South Carolina man's baby mama drama escalated from a verbal tit-for-tat to full-on physical violence in early 2019. His child's mother allegedly assaulted his girlfriend. 22-year-old Savannah Grace White was accused of driving to the victim's house and attacking her with a stun gun. The woman managed to wrestle the stun gun away from White and held her down until police arrived. The 911 dispatcher who took a call about the incident overheard a woman yelling, I'm going to kill you in the background. Deputies arrived to find White bleeding profusely from a head wound. In her mugshot, White had an array of painful looking injuries, including cuts, bruises, and a swollen black eye. She certainly looks like someone who went looking for trouble and regretted it later on. Just that morning, the victim had gone to the Spartanburg County Sheriff's Office and asked about the possibility of getting a restraining order against White. After the attack, she told responding deputies that White had been harassing and threatening her simply because she was dating the father of White's child. The victim's father-in-law backed up her version of events. White allegedly claimed that she believed the victim was abusing her son and that she brought the stun gun with her to the woman's house for self-defense. Deputies determined that she was the aggressor in the situation and arrested her on suspicion of assault and battery. Two years after the altercation, White posted a TikTok video standing by her claims that White abused her child. While the outcome of the criminal case is unclear, the court reportedly limited the father's visitation time due to the allegations. Number 13. Shigeharu Shirai Japan's organized criminal gangs known as the Yakuza have roots dating back at least three centuries. Known for their strict code of conduct, traditional hierarchy, and heavily tattooed bodies that remain hidden beneath from public view, these organizations control a vast portion of the country's drug trade and other illegal activities revolving around gambling, loan sharking, smuggling, sports, and other forms of entertainment. Yakuza tattoos tend to cover large portions of both the upper and lower body, and they consist of different designs and symbolism that are specific to each faction. But you'd never know it from seeing members in their civilian clothes, which typically conceal any sign of their strategically placed ink. Some Yakuza members are more open than others when it comes to showing off their ink, but it's a tradition for them to cover up their tattoos due to the gang's long-standing association with corruption and other illegal activity. Society often looks down on people who are involved in the Yakuza, so it's for members to keep their affiliation with the gang a secret. Without a shirt on, however, a Yakuza member would be extremely easy to spot and identify as being associated with one of these criminal groups. Such was the case for Shigehuru Shirai, an elderly Yakuza boss who fled Japan in 2003 after allegedly shooting his rival, Kazuhiko Otobi. Authorities suspected Shirai of hiding out in Thailand, where he spent the next 14 years eluding capture. Meanwhile, seven other Yakuza members were convicted and sentenced to prison time for their roles in the murder. Shirai was finally captured in early 2018 after a social media user in Thailand posted photos of him hanging out in public with no shirt on, revealing his distinctive Yakuza tattoos. The man in the pictures also had a shortened pinky finger, which reflects the Yakuza's tradition of members cutting the tip off the appendage as the way to atone for breaking a rule. Shirai had managed to fly under the radar, even amid a joint investigation between the Japanese Interpol and the Thai Immigration Bureau. After the photos appeared online, they went viral, catching the attention of the authorities who were looking for Shirai. And while the senior citizen was visibly old, frail, and not very tough-looking, his tattoos spoke to his status as a career criminal. At the request of Japanese officials, Thai authorities apprehended Shirai who admitted to being the leader of the Kodakai subgroup of the Yakuza. The 74-year-old denied killing Otobi, but was extradited to Japan for being in the country illegally and to face the murder allegation in court. After first arriving in Thailand, Shirai had lived out of hotels and friends' homes to avoid creating a trail for police to follow. He ran out of money, lived in parks, and eventually married and lived an outwardly normal life. Shirai kept a low profile while receiving money a few times a year from a Japanese visitor. It's unclear what happened after he returned to Japan, but he was most likely held accountable for his alleged past crimes in court. Number 12. Pirate Tuesday 
The next person on today's list has made news headlines numerous times over the years, not only because of his heavily tattooed face, but because of his lengthy history of disturbing crimes. 42-year-old Pirate Tuesday, formerly known as Daniel Selovich, has a rap sheet consisting of assault allegations and convictions spanning several states. In November 2020, a woman connected with Tuesday on a dating app and met up with him in Downey, Idaho. She allowed Tuesday to stay the night at her place, but ended up calling the police on him for allegedly burning her with cigarettes and scratching her across the back. More specifically, the victim accused Tuesday of biting her neck and lips so hard that she cried. She also claimed that he held her mouth open and ashed his cigarette into her mouth while taking a photo with his phone. The woman told Banner County deputies that she believed the man had recently been in Salt Lake City and that he had used her phone to see if he had any arrest warrants in Utah. During a phone conversation with the Salt Lake City police, the deputies learned that Tuesday had allegedly headbutted a woman repeatedly in a hotel room just weeks earlier. Neither of the women in Utah and Idaho initially wanted to press charges against him. The more police dove into the transient's background, the more previous arrests they discovered. They also found multiple news articles detailing Tuesday's past run-ins with the law, as well as two social media pages dedicated to tracking the dangerous offender's whereabouts. Tuesday's track record dates at least as far back as 2004, when he was convicted of assaulting a woman in California. In 2009, he was accused of burning a disabled woman with cigarettes. He was also arrested multiple times in Florida and Missouri for vagrancy, panhandling, forgery, burglary, vandalism, and other charges. In 2015, he allegedly tortured a woman for five weeks at a remote cabin in Alaska. According to police, Tuesday beat, kicked, bit, and cut the victim. He also duct-taped her to him at night, tethered her to a ceiling rafter with a rope, and threatened to cut her face off. Authorities charged Tuesday with kidnapping and other crimes, but the case was thrown out when the woman died of a drug overdose. The following year, Tuesday was extradited to Nevada over an assault case from 12 years earlier that he had been linked to through DNA. He pleaded guilty to a reduced charge and was out of prison again by 2020. The woman in Downey, Idaho eventually called the police back and said that she wanted to move forward with criminal charges against Tuesday. She explained that she had been reluctant to file a complaint because she was afraid that Tuesday would retaliate against her. Tuesday was booked into custody on two counts of felony aggravated battery, two counts of misdemeanor battery, and an enhancement for being a persistent offender. In early 2022, Tuesday took a plea deal and agreed to pay a fine. He was released from jail and seems to have kept out of trouble since then. Number 11. Nicholas Freeman during the early morning hours one day in January 2016, gunfire broke out between rival gang members outside a motel in Oklahoma City. At least 29 shots were exchanged between the parties, with four of the bullets striking and killing 38-year-old Justin Chunky J. Lucas of the United Aryan Brotherhood gang. On the other side of the shootout were three members of a gang called the Irish Mob. Police arrested 33-year-old Nicholas Nick the Mick Freeman, 24-year-old Curtis Jarhead Rouse, and 29-year-old Brian Guns Cleary on multiple charges, including murder. They pleaded not guilty and were held in custody while awaiting trial. At the time, the UAB and the Irish mob were at war with one another. The Irish mob was reportedly under a standing order from its leaders to smash on sight and were being rewarded with up to half a pound of meth for taking action against rivals. After the motel shooting, Irish mob ringleaders apparently became worried that witnesses would talk about what they saw. From behind prison walls, these top-ranking members ordered the execution of witnesses. One alleged informant was shot in the chest in front of his home, and a failed attempt was made to shoot another witness in the head. The FBI was paying attention to the gang's activities, resulting in a slew of federal charges against 34-year-old kingpin Richard Lucky Joseph Coker. He was accused of directing the distribution of drugs on the outside while in prison and of numerous other offenses. In an intercepted phone call he made using a contraband cell phone, Coker allegedly told an associate to blow the head off of a woman he felt was compromising the gang's ability to steer clear of law enforcement. Freeman, Rouse, and Cleary were convicted in the motel murder and are serving a hundred year sentences. Coker managed to avoid a charge for witness intimidation and is serving an 18-year sentence 
sentence for trafficking drugs. These are just some of the many arrests that came as part of a large-scale investigation into the gang's activities in the region. The Irish mob's retaliation against members who they believed would turn state's witness falls in line with the gang's tradition of intimidating and silencing witnesses. The organization is not above targeting women and kidnapping children, and its heavily tattooed members are as hardcore as they look. Number 10. Caius Weyawus Caius Weyawus was a self-proclaimed vampire and Satanist who rolled with a pretty rough crowd, including members of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. Born in Augusta, Maine as Roy Gutfinski Jr., he changed his name to Caius Weyawus in 2008. In addition to a face full of tattoos, including the number 666 inked on his forehead, he had large, subdermal, horn-like implants. One day in 2011, Weyawus left a Hells Angels party with a patched member named Adam Lee Hall and another man named David Chalou. Later that day, they returned to the Hells Angels clubhouse and bragged that they had just committed a brutal triple murder. The trio had kidnapped, stabbed, shot, and dismembered their victims. Their main target was a man named David Glasser, who was slated to schedule against Hall in an upcoming assault trial. The other two victims, Edward Frampton and Robert Chadwell, were killed because they were witnesses to Hall's murder. In other words, they were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they paid for it with their lives. A few days after the triple homicide, the victims were reported missing. Their remains were found in a trench two weeks after the murders. During a search of one of the suspects' homes, police found hatchets, knives, a machete, and other tools that they believed were used to cut up the victims' bodies. Authorities charged Hall, Chalou, and Weyawis with three counts each of murder, kidnapping, and intimidating a witness. The defendants denied any involvement in the killings. Because the evidence against Weyawis was largely circumstantial, investigators gave him an opportunity to secure a more favorable outcome than he was facing in exchange for information that would help convict his co-defendants. He flat out refused to talk, despite being offered a deal that would come with a seven-year sentence, as opposed to the life term he faced. During Weyawis's trial, a former employer testified that the defendant was trying to get his own motorcycle in hopes of eventually becoming a Hell's Angel when the triple murder occurred. It's fair to speculate that by participating in the gruesome homicide, Weyawis was trying to improve his street cred which is also what he was probably trying to do by refusing to cooperate with investigators. Weyawis, Chalu, and Hall were all convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Number 9. Kamprasong Thamabong in what began as a routine traffic stop in Fresno, California in 2016, a police officer realized he was pulling over a known member of the Laos Bloods Gang. 33-year-old Kamprasong Thamavong was on probation at the time, and the officer didn't want to take any chances on handling the situation alone. He called for backup from the Southeast Violent Crime Impact Team, who proceeded to Thamavong's home, which was open to search and seizure at the time. Inside the house, the team found a semi-automatic rifle and a semi-automatic handgun, neither of which was registered to Thamavong as well as tactical gear, photographs of the suspect holding various weapons, drug paraphernalia, and a marijuana growing operation consisting of 38 plants. Police arrested Thamavong on suspicion of multiple charges, including being a felon in possession of a firearm and growing marijuana. It's unclear what Thamavong is up to these days, but with tattoos covering practically his entire face, including the word Gucci on his forehead, it's hard not to think that he might struggle to fit in anywhere other than prison or on the streets. Number 8. Randy Petersilge Back in November 2001, police in Newport Ritchie, Florida responded to a 911 call about a death at an apartment complex that was under construction. They arrived to find the body of a man named Simon Clark in one of the units where he had been bludgeoned to death with a baseball bat. The murder weapon was found at the scene, but investigators failed to develop any meaningful leads in the case. According to court documents, law enforcement had been quick to identify a man named Randy Petersilge as a person of interest in Clark's murder. With an almost completely tattooed face, he certainly looks the part of a ruthless killer off the street. But without sufficient evidence to make an arrest, police had no choice but to let Peter Silge remain in the free world while the case went cold. In 2015, Peter Silge was sentenced to 42 months in federal prison for a gun charge. 
During his time there, detectives with the new Port Ritchie police reopened the case into Clark's murder. They re-interviewed witnesses who were able to offer some more context and detail about what they had experienced that day. And an entirely new witness who had seen the homicide firsthand came forward. The informant, Jason Azevedo, told investigators that he was initially afraid to reach out to them because Peter Silge had forced him to hit Clark with the bat in order to make him a party to the crime. He said he was now willing to cooperate and had finally opened up to law enforcement because he remained plagued by his memories of the incident. Azevedo's story was backed up by another witness named Denise Sanders who said that Peter Silge had admitted to the murder after the fact. Finally armed with enough evidence to proceed with a criminal case, authorities charged Peter Silge with Clark's murder. Prosecutors accused the defendant of defrauding a friend of the victim and using the money to buy drugs. After catching on that something wasn't right, Clark's friend refused to pay out any more money, and Peter Silge reacted with deadly violence. Peter Silge pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder, but was convicted of the charge and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Number 7. Dylan Alexander Steele In August 2013, a 30-year-old man covered in satanic tattoos named Dylan Alexander Steele robbed a civilian at gunpoint in broad daylight outside a convenience store in Amarillo, Texas. While attempting to flee law enforcement, he pointed a gun at police officers who responded by firing their service weapons. Luckily, nobody was shot, but Steele continued to put up a fight as officers tased him and took him into custody. By then, the suspect already he had one prior burglary conviction under his belt stemming from an incident in Oklahoma from 2007. While in county lockup awaiting trial for the robbery charge in April 2014, Steele sent a letter to a federal courthouse in Amarillo threatening to blow it sky high. In the letter, which was addressed to U.S. District Judge Mary Lou Robinson, he wrote that he planned to kill everyone in the courthouse and that maybe after nothing but death and destruction, someone will listen then. After receiving the letter, FBI agents paid Steele a visit at the Potter County Jail. He told the feds that he didn't really plan on following through with his threats, but that he wanted to alert a federal judge to human rights violations that he felt were going on inside the jail. And while Steele's campaign for better prison conditions is certainly respectable and valid, he learned the hard way that threatening to blow up a federal building is not an effective way to get someone to listen. Steele was sentenced to 35 years in state prison on the aggravated robbery charge. He pleaded guilty to one federal count of mailing threatening communication and received a 10-year sentence. Number 6. Jansen Simon As of mid-2017, 30-year-old Jansen Simon had been on the run from authorities for four years, and he probably could have kept it that way if he hadn't flagged down an off-duty police deputy for a ride one night in Raceland, Louisiana. Simon got into the cruiser and told the deputy that his friends had ditched him on the roadside. In keeping with standard protocol, the deputy verified Simon's identity. Even if it wasn't required, he most likely would have wanted to because there's no denying that Simon is a shady-looking character, thanks to his face full of homemade tattoos. Simon was wanted for aggravated second-degree battery for allegedly hitting a man on the head with a hammer during a bar fight back in 2013. He also had two outstanding arrest warrants out of La Fourche Parish for contempt of court. A sheriff spokesperson told local station Fox 8 that it was unclear whether Simon realized he was flagging down a cop. The suspect was booked into custody and held without bond. Louisiana prison records show that he's currently in custody, but the details of his convictions are not provided. Number 5. Jacob Joe Porter Anyone who gets arrested often is bound to have a collection of mugshots showing how their appearance has changed over time, and some people's transformations are more dramatic than others. A series of booking photos of a man from Lubbock, Texas, named Jacob Joe Porter, show how he went from having very few tattoos to being almost completely covered in them over a less than four-year period beginning in mid-2013. In his earlier mugshots, Porter looked young, heavy-set, and almost innocent. Even though he was in his 20s at the time, his boyish appearance made him seem more like a wayward teen than a hardened criminal. But as they say, looks can be deceiving, and over the years, Porter's appearance has transformed to more accurately resemble his status as a repeat felon with multiple prison stints under his belt. His once chubby-cheeked and seemingly angelic face is now chiseled, tough, and covered in a large skeleton tattoo. 
According to law enforcement, Porter's tattoos may be linked to the notorious Tango Blast prison gang. Several of the designs, including one that says Certified Gangster, are known to be associated with the group. In early 2016, Porter was accused of beating up his pregnant girlfriend, Mercedes Ramirez, and threatening her with a knife. According to police, the repeat offender rushed at the victim, kicked her, and punched her repeatedly with a closed fist, including in the stomach. He then went to the kitchen, grabbed a butcher knife, and chased after his girlfriend. Ramirez reportedly told police that Porter had used cocaine that evening before the assault. Porter was charged with aggravated assault and booked into the Lubbock County Jail while awaiting trial. Just two months earlier, Ramirez had bailed Porter's out of jail in an unrelated case. The couple remained in contact following Porter's arrest, and Ramirez told the court during his trial that they were still together. She said that on the day of the attack, Porter lost his temper when a relative made a joke about Ramirez having an affair. Porter opted for a bench trial, which meant that his fate would be left up to the judge rather than a jury. The judge found Porter guilty of domestic violence and sentenced him to 15 years in prison, which he would have to serve half of before having any chance at seeing freedom again. In his ruling, the judge concluded that Porter had used a deadly weapon and caused bodily injury. He also considered the defendant's past conviction for aggravated assault in determining the appropriate sentence. Number 4. Matthew Ezekiel Steger After being released from a federal prison in Petersburg, Virginia in February 2017, a dangerous offender named Matthew Ezekiel Steger was supposed to fly to a transitional home in Texas to prepare him for life on the outside. But the 45-year-old never arrived as planned, prompting the U.S. Marshals to launch a manhunt. Hoping to capture the fleeing fugitive quickly, authorities appealed to the public for information on Steger's whereabouts. It wouldn't be hard for someone to spot the balding felon who had what was left of his hair styled into unkempt blonde dreadlocks, with a collection of bizarre tattoos covering his face, including a large eye on his forehead and peace signs, palm trees and flowers on various parts of his face and neck, Steger was truly a unique specimen. Described in court documents as an admitted witch from North Carolina, he was serving five years for failing to register as an offender in connection with a previous assault conviction from 1999. Authorities apprehended Steger near a Washington, D.C. subway station six days after he went on the lam, when two police officers recognized him. A lot of people were left wondering how the U.S. government loses an entire prisoner while transferring them from one point of custody to another. According to a Bureau of Prison spokesperson, some prisoners are allowed to self-report while moving between facilities. Only inmates who are deemed to be of minimal risk are allowed to travel by themselves, but as this incident shows, they still can't all be trusted. And who can blame them? The taste of freedom that comes along with traveling alone probably makes it hard for someone to go to a place with rules and restrictions, even when they're on their way to a halfway house rather than a prison. And while Steger was considered a minimal risk inmate, authorities admitted he had a history of drug abuse and mental illness, and his convictions themselves are enough to cause concern. So the next time you fly alone, just remember that the stranger next to you could actually be a prisoner en route to his or her next phase of incarceration. Number 3. Christopher Wilson When news of 37-year-old Christopher Wilson's arrest in Cincinnati, Ohio first broke in 2017, there weren't many details available about him. The disheveled and bushy-bearded suspect was mainly attracting media attention because of the I'm a porn star tattoo he had inked across his forehead, along with another vulgar tattoo beneath it. According to police, Wilson was charged with assault in connection with a case from two years earlier. He was accused of trying to take a woman to the ground by punching and kicking her, and he also allegedly groped her. The victim was able to identify Wilson from a photo lineup as her attacker. Shortly after Wilson's arrest, his attorney told the court that he planned to ask for a mental health health evaluation to determine whether his client was competent to stand trial. While the outcome of the case is unclear, none of the five Christopher Wilsons who are currently in the Ohio State Prison System have a tattoo on their forehead, so it's probably safe to assume that he paid his dues to society and regained his freedom at some point. Number 2. Paul Terry 
A Tulsa resident became the victim of a home break-in one day in 2015 when a pair of intruders forced their way into his residence. The thieves demanded the victim's wallet at knife point and fled the scene. The victim had an easy time describing one of the intruders to police, a man with devil horn tattoos on his forehead and the words F cops inked above his eyebrows. Identified as 26-year-old Paul Wayne Terry, the suspect also had a tattoo of kissing lips on his cheek and a Nazi SS symbol beneath his left eye. Based on the victim's description of the suspect's distinctive tattoos, police were able to track Terry down relatively quickly. They took him into custody the day after the robbery and charged him with robbery with a dangerous weapon after the commission of a felony. It certainly wasn't Terry's first time landing in hot water with the law. Just six months earlier, he had pleaded guilty to domestic assault and battery, malicious injury to property, and interfering with an emergency telephone call. Terry's alleged accomplice, 29-year-old ex-girlfriend Sonia Morrow, was also arrested in connection with the case. She was charged with robbery with a dangerous weapon and was booked into the county jail while awaiting the next steps in her case. And now for number one, but if you want to hear even more stories, stay tuned for some extra content that you might have missed. Number one, tackled and tattooed. In 2011, a woman in Dell City, Oklahoma, accused 18-year-old Stetson Johnson of making unwanted advances on her. She told three of her friends about it, and they decided that Johnson needed to be taught a lesson. Richard Dellert, Zachary Province, Kimberly Kirchler Vergara, and Lorena Hodges. The two male suspects, Dellert and Province, threw Johnson to the ground and kicked him in the face dozens of times, while the two female suspects, Vergara and Hodges, took turns shocking his privates with a stun gun. They duct taped Johnson's hands together and tattooed the misspelled word rapest on his forehead, along with an inappropriate phrase on his chest. The group forced the teen into a car, drove to nearby Eagle Lake, and proceeded to beat him unconscious with a baseball bat. When he regained consciousness a few hours later, his attackers were gone. Johnson felt dizzy as he rose to his feet and he failed to flag down a passing motorist, but he managed to reach a nearby neighborhood where a resident called 911 for him. Emergency responders rushed a young man to the hospital where he received 18 stitches to close a large gash in his head and treatment for other injuries, including a fractured skull, a broken nose, and multiple wounds. A police spokesperson later said that Johnson was near death by the time he managed to seek help. Johnson denied violating the young woman who accused him of trying to put the moves on her, and law enforcement said there was no evidence to suggest that the allegation was true. The young man, who struggles with a learning disability, later recounted feeling terrified and thinking he was going to die during the attack. After being released from the hospital, Johnson had the unsightly tattoo on his forehead covered up by a design resembling a barcode, with hopes of eventually getting it removed. A clinic eventually found out about his story and removed the unwanted ink for free. The four suspects were arrested for the brutal beatdown and ended up pleading guilty to kidnapping and maiming charges. Three of the defendants pleaded guilty to assault and battery, while a fourth defendant pleaded no contest to the charge. Kimberly Kirchler Vergara and Lorena Hodges were each sentenced to five years in prison, followed by five years of probation. After being deemed the more culpable parties involved in the attack, Richard Dellert and Zachary Province were sentenced to 10 years in prison followed by 10 years of probation. 16. Spencer Ross Pearson In June of 2023, a star softball player named Madison Shemitz and her mum, 43-year-old Jackie Roger, met with some friends at a restaurant in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, for dinner. They were seated at an outdoor table when the group spotted Madison's ex-boyfriend, 18-year-old Spencer Ross Pearson, sitting at a table nearby. Less than a week earlier, Madison and her mum had filed a police report against Pearson for allegedly following her on her way to school and leaving notes on her car. They were broken up and Madison wanted to keep it that way, but Pearson clearly didn't. This was just one of several complaints Madison made starting in April 2023. In another report, she accused Pearson of harassing her using fake social media accounts. Madison's mother had contacted Pearson's mother with concerns about his mental health and was told that the family would handle the situation accordingly. After noticing her ex-boyfriend at the restaurant, Madison and Jackie left to avoid a confrontation. 
According to police, Pearson charged toward them and attacked them from behind with a knife while they were walking to their car. He allegedly pinned Madison to the ground and stabbed her at least 15 times, leaving her gravely injured. Jacqueline tried to intervene and was stabbed in the forehead and leg. A brave bystander managed to disarm the suspect and was also wounded. In a warrant, police stated that Pearson then caused a horrific, self-inflicted injury to his neck. Madison survived, but has now been left paralyzed by the attack. For now, she remains in the hospital. After being treated for his wounds, Pearson was booked into the St. John's County Jail on two counts of attempted premeditated murder and one count of aggravated battery with a deadly weapon causing permanent disability. 15. Parker Julian Bijlow When a relationship is short-lived, most people get over it and move on fairly quickly. This wasn't the case with 25-year-old Julian Bijlow. According to Miami prosecutors, who've accused the young man from North Carolina of relentlessly stalking a woman he only dated for three months. An arrest warrant claims that Bijlow began harassing the woman about six months after the pair broke up. The victim received threatening phone calls and text messages from countless phone numbers and was also contacted on social media. At one point, Bijlow allegedly made good on his threats to send intimate photos of the woman to her friends and family. According to the warrant, the phone and internet harassment eventually escalated into real-life torment. In late 2021, the victim accused Bijlow of running her car off the road and then running up to the vehicle and banging on the window. On another occasion, she told police that Bijlow had knocked on her window at night. She pursued legal recourse in both Florida and North Carolina and was granted multiple protective orders against Bijlow. But the harassment continued on a daily basis. At its worst, the woman received 300 emails in a single day. Bijlow also allegedly sent text messages to the victim's sister, threatening to kill both women and the sister's child in gruesome ways. He was finally taken into custody in June of 2023 on suspicion of 12 felonies, including four counts each of extortion and written threats to kill, three counts of cyber harassment, and one count of aggravated stalking. The alleged stalker remains behind bars on a $180,000 bond while he awaits the next step in the case. 14. Zachariah Anderson In May of 2020, police responded to a request for a welfare check at the Kenosha, Wisconsin home of 40-year-old Rosario Gutierrez Jr. They found his patio door open and blood all over the apartment, but Gutierrez himself was nowhere to be found. It was clear that it met with foul play, but his loved ones struggled to wrap their minds around the situation. Gutierrez was a genuinely nice person who had no known enemies, so it made no sense that he was the victim of what appeared to be a very personal and rage-filled crime. Unfortunately, no one is immune to becoming the target of a mentally disturbed person's uncontrollable anger, and Gutierrez was dating a woman with a very jealous ex when he went missing. Sadie Beecham had broken up with the father of her three kids, Zachariah Anderson, several months before Gutierrez disappeared. She was ready to move on, but Anderson wasn't about to let that happen. On the day Gutierrez was reported missing, police visited Anderson's property and discovered a burn pit containing torn clothes and a burn bottle of bleach. Inside the suspect's minivan, they found a piece of carpet that reeked of bleach and blood that was later identified as belonging to Gutierrez. Investigators also uncovered evidence that Anderson had followed Gutierrez and gone to his apartment in the days leading up to his disappearance. At the time they believed Gutierrez was killed, Anderson's phone showed no activity, further suggesting that he was responsible for the victim's fate. The suspect was also seen buying cleaning supplies at Walmart on the night of the alleged murder. Bank records showed that Arneson had recently withdrawn tens of thousands of dollars from the bank, leading police to believe he planned to use the money as an escape fund. On his computer, detectives found a folder dedicated specifically to gathering information about Gutierrez. Gutierrez's body was never found, and it's rare for prosecutors to try someone for murder without a body. 
But in this case, they felt like they had enough evidence to prove their case, so they went ahead and charged Anderson. At trial, they argued that the defendant was jealous of Beecham's new relationship. Anderson's defense attorneys accused the prosecution of getting tunnel vision and ignoring other possible explanations for Gutierrez's disappearance. But the jury found the evidence compelling enough to convict Anderson of murder, hiding a corpse, and two counts of stalking. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years, which means that he'll be in his early 80s at his first opportunity of seeing freedom again. 13. Wendy Wine The Rent A Hitman website holds something of a legendary place in the internet world. It was created in 2005 by a man named Bob Inez, and even if someone hasn't heard of it, it doesn't exactly take a genius to realize that it's a parody. Not only is the website not on the dark web, there are obvious hints all over the page that it's not real. But this hasn't stopped numerous people from submitting serious inquiries about having someone in their life killed. In one of the latest cases, a 52-year-old Michigan woman named Wendy Wine filled out the form in 2020 in hopes that someone would murder her ex-husband. In one message, she wrote that she was surprised the site wasn't on the dark web and expressed her concern about going to jail. But the temptation was planted, and Wine eventually went back onto the website and struck up another conversation with its supposed admin, Guido Finelli, aka Bob Inez. Inez said he went years without checking the site and decided to keep it when he realized it was a useful tool for preventing murders. Bob Inez later told CNN that he always gives a customer 24 hours to cool off and take back their request before going to law enforcement. But when he checked with Wine at the 24-hour mark, she said she was sure she wanted to follow through with the plan. At that point, Inez alerted the Michigan State Police, who sent a plainclothes officer to meet Wine in a parking lot to discuss the details of the job. During the meeting, Wine forked over a $200 cash down payment, promised to pay $5,000 total, and provided the undercover with the victim's home address, workplace, and schedule. She was arrested soon after. Wine pleaded guilty to solicitation of murder and using a computer to commit a crime. She was sentenced to 7 to 20 years in prison. According to records, her earliest possible release date is 2027, and her latest possible release is listed as 2040. At her sentencing hearing, she said she was going through a lot when she committed the crimes, including the recent loss of eight friends and family members. Wendy apologized to the court, as well as to her family and her ex-husband, and she vowed to attend all the available rehab and mental health programs that were available to her in prison. Her ex-husband had an opportunity to speak at the hearing, but he had nothing to say. 12. Lainey Minotti A man was getting it on with a woman inside his Portsmouth, New Hampshire apartment one night in 2017 when his ex-girlfriend, 23-year-old Lainey Minotti, allegedly entered without knocking. She walked right in on the action and was promptly escorted out by her ex-boyfriend, who claimed that Minotti pushed the locked front door open and came back inside. He accused the young woman of scratching both him and the woman he was hooking up with. By the time police arrived, the suspect was no longer at the scene, so a warrant was issued. Authorities charged Minotti with burglary, trespass, simple assault, and domestic violence simple assault. No other information was available when the story broke, and the outcome of the case is unclear. 11. Christy Felkins People do shady things on the dark web, but even its most seasoned users typically draw the line somewhere. In early 2019, the FBI received a tip from the administrator of a website advertising hitmen for hire about a woman who'd contacted him with a seemingly serious request to have her ex-husband murdered. The website, Baser Mafia, was a scam. Its operator was happy to take people's money, but they never actually carried out any of the hits, assaults, or kidnappings that were advertised on the site. In their tip to the FBI, the admin identified 35-year-old Nevada resident Christy Felkins as the person seeking their services. The conversation between Felkins and the website's operator began almost three years earlier in February 2016. 
At first, Falcon's questions were along the lines of how to buy Bitcoin and how to ensure their communications went undetected by law enforcement. She also wanted to know that the Hitman website was serious about the services it offered. After doing some research, she was skeptical, and she was additionally worried that the person she was talking to was an undercover cop. The admin told Falcons to go ahead and find a hitman on the street if she didn't trust hiring someone online, and the bit of reverse psychology seemed to convince her that Beza Mafia was the real deal. After a few months of talking, Falcons forked over $5,000 worth of Bitcoin for the murder of her ex-husband, who was living in North Carolina at the time. She provided the admin with the victim's address and identified the best time for the murder as the sooner the better. The admin strung Falcons along for as long as possible. They came up with a few excuses for why the first few planned hits didn't pan out and eventually told Falcons that the hitman had been unable to find a time when her ex-husband was alone. For this reason, a sniper was needed and it would cost an additional $9,000. Falcons responded, saying she was at the end of her borrowing limit. At some point during the conversation, the admin asked her to explain why she wanted her ex-husband killed. She admitted that she stood to gain money from his death, but that it wasn't her primary motivation for seeking out a hitman. Falcons claimed that her ex abused her during their marriage and alienated her from her children when they separated. She further explained that the people in her life didn't have a lot of money and that she'd already borrowed as much as she could from them to cover her divorce costs. After being reassured that Falcons would receive her retirement, house, and a large life insurance payout, the admin said he would have the sniper carry out the hit and that she could pay them back later. This seemed to come as music to Falcons' ears, based on her prompt response urging for the hitman to get the job done that night. Of course, it didn't happen, and the admin kept Falcon on the hook for a few more weeks. When a certain amount of time went by without her ex-husband being killed, she appeared to get frustrated with the website. In one message, she wrote that if Baser Mafia wasn't going to do the job as promised, then they needed to stop wasting her time and give her a refund so she could take her business elsewhere. She eventually gave up. Three years later, she was charged with one count of using interstate commerce facilities in the commission of murder for hire. Falcons pleaded guilty to the charge. She faced a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison, but it's unclear how much time she was actually ordered to serve. 10. Mark Martin While most people were watching the Super Bowl in 2021, a California woman, her boyfriend, and her two kids were scrambling to escape a house fire. Someone had broken into the garage of their Visalia home, doused the area near the hot water heater with gasoline, and set it ablaze. The flames quickly spread to the couple's cars and elsewhere throughout the house. Thankfully, the family escaped. Investigators initially attributed the cause of the fire to a hot water tank malfunction but a closer look at the scene revealed that it was a deliberate arson. Surveillance footage from the neighborhood showed a man matching the description of the woman's ex-boyfriend, 38-year-old Mark Martin, riding through the area on a BMX bike, which was his chosen mode of transportation. It wasn't entirely surprising to learn that Martin was a suspect. Prior to the arson, he'd allegedly embarked on a ruthless harassment campaign against his ex-girlfriend which included voicemail saying that he hoped the woman would burn to death and die as low death. The woman's new boyfriend had found a note on his car warning him to end the relationship. After the fire, Martin was accused of sending his ex a Snapchat stating that he was serious about his plans to start a fire and the amount of fear he hoped it caused her. According to witnesses, Martin bragged about committing the arson less than an hour after he set fire to the home. The most disturbing aspect of the crime is that he was the father of the two kids who were inside the house when the blaze broke out. A jury convicted Martin of four counts of attempted murder with premeditation and deliberation, one count of arson, and one count of first-degree residential burglary. He was sentenced to life in prison with the earliest possible parole date of 2051. 9. Kiara Van Lanen in early February 2023, a Green Bay, Wisconsin woman filed a police report containing wild allegations against her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend, 33-year-old Kiara Van Lanen. 
according to a criminal complaint obtained by news station WFRV Local 5. Van Larnett had shown up at the woman's home about a month earlier and either kicked or forced her way through the front door. The suspect allegedly threatened to injure the woman, threw a phone at the man and kicked the woman's car so hard it left a dent in the door. In the complaint, the victim also accused Van Lanen of harassing her on Facebook and making anonymous complaints about her to her workplace in an apparent effort to sabotage her job. When she left that day, the woman said the suspect was there waiting for her. Van Lanen's ex-boyfriend reportedly told police that Van Lanen had hit him in the face with a phone and stabbed him in the knee with a pocket knife during the home intrusion. For reasons that have not been explained, Van Lanen and her ex shared a phone at the time of the incident, enabling the victims to easily access her internet search history, which they turned over screenshots of to the police. According to the complaint, one of the searches was for the contact information of the woman's employer. When police gave Van Lanen a chance to tell her side of the story, she claimed that she was let into the victim's house. She admitted to throwing the phone at her ex-boyfriend and punching him, but said that it only happened after he tried restraining her. Van Lanen denied having any memory of threatening anyone and acknowledged that her emotions got the best of her. She was charged with two counts of felony stalking, which each carry a sentence of up to three and a half years in prison. Felony first-degree reckless endangering of safety, which carries a maximum punishment of 12 years behind bars, and battery, criminal trespass, criminal damage, and disorderly conduct, which are all misdemeanors. The case is ongoing. 8. Derek W. Brown A Houston woman lived in terror for over a decade at the hands of an unrelenting ex who was undeterred even after he was sent to prison for stalking her. While authorities declined to elaborate on the exact nature of the stalking and harassment, they noted that it was constant and that Derek W. Brown targeted his ex and her family. The woman repeatedly sought help from law enforcement, and in 2011, Brown was charged with stalking. He was convicted of the crime three years later and was sentenced to five years in prison. Just days after his release in 2019, he once again began tormenting his victims. Brown was found guilty of stalking for a second time following a bench trial in 2023. At his sentencing, Assistant District Attorney Erica Robinson Windsor implored the judge to hand down a heavy punishment, pointing out that the victim did everything in her power to seek protection. But no amount of protective orders and criminal complaints seemed to be enough to stop Brown. During the trial, experts reportedly testified that as long as Brown was a free man, the victim's life was in danger. The judge imposed a 35-year sentence, ensuring that he won't get out of prison any time soon. Finally, after more than 10 years of suffering, his ex and her loved ones have gotten their lives back. They can now focus on healing and enjoy no longer having to live in constant fear. It's scary, but not necessarily surprising when a stalker is released from prison and goes right back to their criminal ways. After all, one of the defining aspects of their behavior is that they often don't stop, even after being arrested and punished. 7. Yan Yan Lesser There are different levels of revenge. When 47-year-old Yan Yan Lesser of East Aurora, New York, found herself wanting payback on her ex-boyfriend in early 2019, she apparently decided that hiring someone to cripple him would be the most appropriate course of action to take. According to federal authorities, Lesser conspired with someone on the dark web to assault the victim, G.Z., who lived in Orlando, Florida at the time. Lesser told the hired helm that she wanted her ex-boyfriend's legs and waist broken. She instructed the person to give G.Z. a good beating and to make it look like a robbery so authorities didn't suspect that it was done out of revenge. The bitter Western New Yorker made it clear that she wanted the victim to sustain lifelong injuries. Ideally, he would spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair, but hurting him badly enough to require crunches would also suffice. In addition to expressing her desire for someone to beat the daylights out of her ex to the point of leaving him permanently handicapped, Lesser warned that the victim primarily spoke Chinese and that the only English word he understood was money. She paid the alleged hit person roughly $7,000 in Bitcoin, showing just how serious she was about making the beatdown happen. 
when federal agents asked Jeezy if he knew of any plans his ex-girlfriend might have to hurt him. He said no, but that she was unstable and totally capable of doing something like this. In a lot of cases, a person seeking these types of services is unknowingly interacting with an undercover agent. This case was particularly concerning because investigators never identified the person Lesser was conspiring with. Lesser was convicted of transmitting in interstate or foreign commerce a communication containing a threat to injure another person. She was spared from federal prison time and was sentenced to one year of supervised release. 6. Courtney Ireland Ainsworth After going their separate ways in 2019, it initially seemed like Courtney Ireland Ainsworth and Lewis Jolly had parted on at least somewhat peaceful terms. They'd dated for two years, but Courtney soon began seeing a new man, while Lewis also focused on moving on with his life. Eventually, however, Lewis became the target of a relentless revenge campaign by his ex-girlfriend. According to authorities, Courtney made as many as 30 fake social media profiles and sent threatening messages to herself, pretending to be Lewis. She reported Lewis to the police at least 10 times throughout 2022, and he was arrested six times based on the false complaints. Lewis was criminally charged with assault and stalking, and was hit with a stay-away order and a curfew. After bailing himself out of jail, he was required to wear an ankle monitor while his case played out. He lost his job and, for the most part, his freedom. In addition to blaming Lewis for the social media messages, Courtney accused him of calling her from blocked numbers, stalking her and her loved ones, filming her in public and sending her the footage, throwing a brick through her grandmother's window and damaging the inside of her home. After the first time Lewis was arrested, the young woman told police that his behavior only worsened. Lewis fought hard for his innocence, and investigators eventually summoned social media data. They connected at least 17 Instagram accounts with Courtney's IP address and email addresses. After enduring a true living hell and being left a shell of a man, Lewis finally cleared his name, and prosecutors charged Courtney with perverting the course of justice. During her court proceedings, her defensive attorney blamed her difficult childhood for her cruel behavior. The judge was less than sold on the excuse, especially after considering the traumatic effects Courtney's actions had on Lewis and his family. She pleaded guilty to the charge and was sentenced to 10 months behind bars. In Lewis's opinion, it was an extremely light punishment considering her actions. He hit such a low point during the harassment that he descended into a severe mental health crisis. Lewis felt powerless as he was repeatedly arrested, had his home torn apart by police, and was subjected to disciplinary measures for crimes he didn't commit. He told the UK Mirror that he was plagued by anxiety between arrests, knowing it was not a matter of if, but when police showed up to take him into custody again. And after having two cell phones taken away by law enforcement, he didn't bother buying another. Instead, he became a shut-in as he struggled with sleeplessness and alcohol abuse. After all Lewis and his family have been through, one can only hope that Courtney Island Ainsworth has learned her lesson and will never inflict such devastation on anyone else's life. 5. Scott Quinn Burkett A few months after connecting with a man named Scott Quinn Burkett through an anime webpage in 2020, a woman flew to Los Angeles to meet her prospective beau. But she quickly discovered during the three days they spent together that they didn't have the chemistry she'd hoped for, at least not on her end. She later described his intimacy style as aggressive. The woman tried to end the relationship several times over the following months, but Burkett continued to contact her and nagged her to continue dating him. If she didn't respond on one social media platform or account, Burkett messaged her through another and another and so on until she replied. The non-stop contact became so overwhelming that the woman's family reached out to Burkett's father and asked for help making it stop. At first, it seemed to work. Burkett messaged the victim saying that he was going to leave her alone, and the woman and her family breathed a collective sigh of relief. But they were unaware that just days later, Burkett went on the dark web and tried to hire a hitman to kill his victim through a website called Internet Killers. Like most murder-for-hire advertisers on the dark web, it wasn't known to follow through with promised hit jobs. 
A tipster contacted the FBI and reported Burkitt's order, which included instructions to make the woman's death look like an accident. He paid $13,000 in Bitcoin. About a month later, an undercover FBI agent contacted Burkitt with photos of his ex that were staged to make it look like she was dead. He was apparently satisfied with the job and sent another $1,000 in Bitcoin for further proof of the murder. Of course, in the end, he learned that the murder never happened and that he'd been talking to the feds almost the entire time. Burkett pleaded guilty to one count of using interstate facilities to commit murder for hire and was sentenced to five years in federal prison. Scott Burkett and his victim barely dated before the woman pumped the brakes on the relationship, if you can even call it that. It would be fair to say that Burkett's level of outrage over things not working out was abnormal. 4. Ex-girlfriend refuses to let go When a woman from Singapore ended her five-month relationship with her girlfriend in October 2021, her former partner pestered her to continue their romance. The unwanted contact came daily in the form of emails, calls, and social media messages. In an attempt to get her point across, the woman told her ex to leave her alone, stopped responding to the woman's social media messages, and eventually blocked her. But her former flick allegedly contacted her from new social media accounts' email addresses. The incessant harassment became so disruptive that the victim reportedly had a hard time using her phone throughout the day. As she arrived home from work one day, she saw her ex waiting for her outside her apartment building. She tried to avoid her stalker, but it was no use. According to a police complaint filed by the victim, the suspect physically restrained her in an effort to stop her from going to her apartment. As the victim tried calling the police, the stalker kept trying to snatch her phone from her hands. Luckily, she eventually reached a friend who contacted law enforcement on her behalf. Police came to the scene and made sure she got inside her apartment safely. Just days later, the stalker was back. Once again, she became physically aggressive when the victim tried going to her apartment, grabbing her by the shoulders and demanding that they get back together. The stalker followed and grabbed the woman, then swiped her phone from her hand and disconnected a call she was trying to make to the police before unblocking herself on the victim's social media. Later that night, the victim filed a police report, but the stalking continued. As she got ready for work one day, she saw her obsessed ex outside and was afraid to leave her apartment. Even after she got a no-contact protective order, the stalker continued bothering her. Authorities eventually arrested the suspect with stalking, and while she avoided jail time, the judge imposed the maximum fine of $5,000. 3. Aaron Clark Shortly after midnight on December 4, 2022, an uncontrollable fire broke out at a home just outside Philadelphia in Derby Township, Pennsylvania. 20-year-old Olivia Drasher, who suffered from cerebral palsy, was unable to escape the blaze alive. Her caretaker was seriously injured trying to save her, and her twin sister and mother survived. Drasher's sister, Amira Rogers, wasn't home at the time of the fire, but she was most likely the intended target of it. Investigators learned that less than 24 hours before the house was engulfed in flames, Rogers had broken up with her now ex-boyfriend, 30-year-old Aaron Clark. She told police that she'd call Clark talking with another woman. When she told him their relationship was over, he allegedly choked her. It was just one of several instances of Rogers accusing Clark of being violent, according to authorities. Months earlier, she claimed that her ex had hit her over the head with a laptop hard enough to crack it. After the post-breakup assault that preceded the fire, Rogers left Clark's house and ignored her phone. She said that Clark text messaged her non-stop and called her over 300 times throughout the rest of the day and that he threatened to post intimate photos of her on social media and show the images of her friends and co-workers. When threats didn't elicit a response, Clark sent Rogers a message saying he messed his ankle up and asking for help. Until the breakup, the former couple worked the same shift at a US Postal Service distribution center. Rogers spoke with her boss immediately afterward and changed shifts. Nobody knew except her supervisor and manager, which means that if Clark was responsible for setting her house on fire in the middle of the night, he probably thought she was home at the time. 
He also allegedly knew that her disabled sister was home and that he was starting the fire on the side of the house that Olivia lived in. All things considered, detectives were quick to zero in on Clark as their top suspect. In addition to having a motive for the crime, a man matching his appearance was seen on surveillance footage near Roger's home on the night of the fire. During a search of Clark's home, police said they found clothes matching the outfit in the surveillance footage and that they stunk like smoke and gasoline. A neighbor who was familiar with Clark claimed that they saw him at the crime scene, close enough to make direct eye contact. Authorities charged Clark with murder, arson, stalking, and various other crimes. Even after he was in custody, he somehow kept texting Rogers. When officers tried to strip search Clark, he was uncooperative. They eventually subdued him and found an Apple Watch in his rectum. As Rogers and her family put their life together after losing a beloved family member and everything they owned, Clark remains behind bars awaiting the next steps in his case. 2. David Wayne Hembry After dating from fall 2017 to May 2019, a Wyoming woman listed in court documents as TB ended her serious relationship with David Wayne Hembry, who was in his early 50s at the time. They were friends with benefits for the next several months, but Hembry continued pushing for a deeper commitment, and TB broke things off for good on Valentine's Day 2020. According to records, Hembry barraged the woman with questions and told her that if she didn't answer, he'd show up at her house and ask. TB complied in hopes of appeasing her overly attached ex, and she made it clear that she didn't want him at her home. Instead of the situation dwindling over time like the victim had hoped, Hembry only grew more persistent. The ex-girlfriend repeatedly told him to leave her alone, and he allegedly did the exact opposite and stepped up his campaign of unwelcome contact. Hembry was accused of driving by the woman's house repeatedly and at all hours, ignoring her repeated commands to stop, and he eventually began driving past her workplace. The victim did what she could to try stopping the incessant harassment. She stopped responding to Hembry's messages and even blocked him, but stalkers always find a way to torment their target. Things went from alarming to downright terrifying one night when the woman rolled over in bed while talking on the phone and saw Hembry standing in the doorway of her bedroom. She shoved him out of the house and called the police, who determined that Hembry had crawled into the house through the doggy door. Shortly after the incident, the ex-girlfriend obtained a no-contact order of protection, which banned Henry from going near her or contacting her in any form. But a piece of paper usually isn't enough to stop a bona fide stalker, and just a week after the order went into effect, the woman reported seeing Henry drive past her house twice in one night. Police located him in TB's neighborhood and arrested him. Deputy Aaron Lane testified in court that Henry claimed he'd just dropped a friend off in the area, but he couldn't name the friend or where they lived, and at that point took Lane into custody. He maintained his innocence throughout the trial, but was found guilty of stalking and criminal entry, and was sentenced to three to six years in prison. Henry appealed his conviction on multiple grounds, but the original ruling was upheld. 1. Marilyn Zhu Investigators in Mercer County, New Jersey, received a somewhat unusual tip in December 2022 when someone informed them of a woman who was seeking to hire a hitman. According to authorities, 56-year-old Marilyn Zhu of Chansford, Pennsylvania, wanted her ex-husband's new wife and the woman's daughter killed. She met with an undercover agent posing as a hitman in Trenton to finalize the details and provided him with two photos of her ex's wife. Zhao allegedly handed over $21,000 in cash as a down payment for the hit and threw in a towel and some gloves as an added bonus. She promised another $20,000 once the job was done. Prosecutors claim that she instructed the hitman to kill the woman's teenage daughter if she happened to be at the scene when he went to carry out the hit. Authorities arrested Zhao shortly after the meeting. During a search of her home, they found around $18,000 in cash and several items that they say she'd suggested that the hitman used during the murder. Marilyn Zhao was charged with two counts of attempted first-degree murder and one count of money laundering. Law enforcement has not announced a possible motive for the crime. 
According to the most recent available updates on the case, prosecutors had filed a motion to keep Zhao behind bars until her trial. Thanks for watching. People preach all the time about how it's important not to judge a book by its cover. And this is a great piece of advice, but everyone rushes to judgment sometimes. If your neighbor were covered head to toe in tattoos and looked like a hardened fugitive, but always treated you with respect and seemed like someone you could even be friends with, do you think you'd be able to put your judgment aside and give them a chance? Or would it be impossible to shake the notion that they must have a past and that it probably isn't pretty? Let us know in the comments below.